Hello, welcome to another episode of Talking Scared. Today we will be talking with the amazing Gina Terry. We'll be bringing her on here very, very shortly. A um, couple announcements beforehand as always. Number one, um, we have had a little bit of a slowdown um, on getting the two reviews out to you as far as the Wells Township and Castle Blood. And I wanted to explain a little bit as to what's been going on there. Um, we have had a crazy week as far as some uh, different family crises have been going on and everything else, and it has slowed down the production on both of those. But they are getting to the point where they we should be wrapping those up here pretty shortly and getting both of those out to you very, very soon. So again, apologies. I uh, had some stuff. <laughs> just just not a great week um, for, for the family life. Um, but... Things are looking a little better in that regards, and we are able to really kind of focus now and get those wrapped up and finished for you. Now, we've also talked a little bit about how an education in horror was going to go away and, and what we were doing to replace that. So I wanted to take a minute and talk about that, what the future of Talking Scared is, number one. Um, I really I'm so excited that the, the response that we've gotten with Talking Scared and just the, the many, many people that have, have watched and the people that are wanting to participate in it and the different actors and actresses as well as the movie director and the authors. We have some other stuff in the works for you as well, some different aspects of the haunt community and the haunt industry that we're going to bring on here as well, continually expanding. So we are excited to announce this uh, starting officially today and really it's kind of been going for uh, a little bit now. Um, Talking Scared is going to be going to weekly, um, weekly episodes every Monday. Um, we're going to do that as long as the people keep coming in. Uh, you guys keep bringing in the actors and actresses for us to talk to, and we're going to keep on, keep on doing what we're doing. Um, right now, we are booked up entirely until the end of June, early July, somewhere around there, and that's weekly. Um, so we're going to have an episode of Talking Scared for you every single week for the rest of the month of April, the rest of the month of May, and we really believe the rest of the month of June, probably rolling right into July. We already have several different bookings in July and August, all the way up into September. Very excited uh, to see the growth of Talking Scared, and that's part of the reason that we were putting the brakes on an education in horror. We didn't talk about it too awfully much as to what exactly we were doing or, or why we were doing things the way that we were doing it. But that's kind of why. This is really taking the forefront, and we love doing this. This is so much fun for us to do. We love being able to interact with you all and everything like that. So again, Talking Scared will be going weekly. We also have... Uh, <laughs> yes, yay. Yay weekly. We are going weekly. We're very excited about that, Nick. We are uh, stoked to be able to bring it to you weekly. And we hope that, that keeps on going. Um, obviously if it slows down, we'll have to go to bi-weekly again, but we don't see that happening anytime in the near future. So we're going to keep on rolling with it. Now, Killer Friday, Serial Killer of the Month. I'm so excited because my boy just lost so badly, um, the first two times around with Joe Matheny. So I find this guy, this weird looking guy, um, Joachim Kroll, uh, still working on that pronunciation a little bit, trying to master that. But I have weeks before I have to do a Killer Friday, so I can say it however I want right now, and it'd be okay. Mr. Kroll, uh, this dude is a straight up, fucked up psychopath. Uh, crazy, crazy, crazy guy. They actually ended up busting him when they found the remains of several of his victims in his drains and in his pipes and stuff like that. Obviously, we'll be talking about that a lot more, but he absolutely destroyed the competition this week. Wasn't even close. I can't even... What was the dude's name? What was it? I can't remember. You don't even remember your own guy's name? No. Oh, man, we're not even putting him up for a vote next week. I, I think they were... At, we might, because it's technically the rules. It's technically how we're supposed to do it, but... uh. Eh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll definitely have two up for vote next month, obviously. Uh, but Mr. Kroll is who we will be focusing on at the end of the month. Now, we also have a brand new segment in store for you uh, that's going to kind of be uh, not an extension of Talking Scared, but kind of similar to the format as far as it being through Facebook Live and everything like that. We're still waiting on Gina. If you're out there, you got send us send us a message, send us a comment, say hey, and we'll bring you right over. Um but like we were saying, a movie, it's a new segment, new segment, I'm getting ahead of myself about to announce the name of the segment without even talking about what the segment's actually going to kind of be. 
As a matter of fact, I think all we're going to tell you about right now is what it's called. It's going to be called Movies with the Minister. It is a... You know what? You'll find out. You'll find out soon enough. We've actually been dropping hints as to kind of what this is going to be. A couple different things, and I don't know. You'd really have to be paying attention to be able to piece it together quite yet. But we will be putting some more of that together and adding some more of that into there. And revealing a little bit more as to what it's going to be. I promise whatever it is in your head right now that you are thinking. One second here. We're bringing her over right now. Whatever it is that you're thinking in your head that movies with the minister is going to be, it's not. You're wrong. You're wrong with whatever you think it is. I promise it's not that. It's <laughs> Hello, Tina. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you. Um, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, we, we love getting to do this every single time. And it's so exciting to see different people from different walks of life all coming together for for one collective purpose and, and one collective love of something. And it's, it's just amazing. I get excited every time. Um, so number <laughs> one, again, Welcome. We are with Gina Terry, who has worked in the haunt community for over 18 years. So we're going to kind of just jump in. We hit all the announcements, right? There's no more announcements. We got everything. We're good. Lights. Oh, yeah. Um, did we? Sorry about that. We're not sure what happened there, folks. We'll uh, see if we can get her back on. Um, but like she, there we go. All right, hold on a sec. Ah, it's Lilith again, man. Lilith. Podcast ever since, and that's another reason we had to let an education more go. Ever since we did Lilith, that bitch has fucked with us all the time since then, and so we had to we had to put that stuff off on hold. But we're bringing Gina back. Sorry about all that. So while we're bringing her back. Um, <laughs> 3,192 mm -hmm. likes as of right now. Um, sorry, we're still, still bringing her over. It's being a little slow. It's the first one. Fucking Lilith, man. Fucking Lilith. But anyways, 3,192 likes as of just a few minutes ago. Thank you all. So, so much. For every single one of that. Hey, hey, welcome back. Are we good? Hi. Yeah, um, I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have demons and stuff that kind of hang out around the house, and they like to fuck with our shit sometimes. And that's all that it was. We, we suspect that one was probably the demon Lilith, the original wife of Adam, but we don't really know for sure. And we're we're trying to cast her out of here and get her the fuck out of our lives. So, anyways, next is <laughs> yeah. Um. So you've been in the hot industry for over eighteen years, correct? Yeah, yeah, awesome. this will be, uh, I started in 2001, so this will be year 18 for me. Nice, that is so cool. Um, so you've been in the haunt industry for 18 years, I'm very sorry, folks, I've not had that before. Um, so that is, this is the second time I'm having that. We're working on it, we'll get it fixed, we always do. Now you get an up close look at my. There we go. We got it. We got her straightened out now. Hey. Well, you need a power to knock it off. I know, I know. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stop. We actually, you know, we'll take a second, Lilith. We ask you for your forgiveness, and I apologize for the shit talking. Please let us continue on with this. Thank you very much. All right, so we're good there. All right, so she's appeased. All right, <laughs> I hope. Um, we're gonna move on. So in the haunt industry, over 18 years, hitting your 18th year now. That means you got <clears throat> involved in the haunt industry at the very young age of 11 years old. Correct. That's what, correct. What yeah. the hell got you in the hunt industry at the age of 11 years old? <laughs> uh, well, growing up, I really didn't fit in with many people. Um, I was obviously, I was outcasted. I, I didn't have cliques or friends or I really didn't even fit in with my family. 
and one day, one of my really good friends, her name is Alicia Olszewski. We, we called her Lishi with two Ys. Very important. Two Ys. Okay. Lishi brought me to the Vermilion Haunted Schoolhouse, which was right in the middle of Vermilion. It was the original K through 12 building um, and introduced me to this <laughs> wild group of people that I would have never have met if I'd never gone there. And I just, I felt like I just finally fit someplace. Nice. And so all summer I helped out with construction and meeting people and trying to come out of my 11 year old shell and and first day opening night i'm scared out of my mind i'm 11 years old Ooh. i've never done this i don't even know what the heck i'm supposed to be doing do i growl do i boo i don't mm, i don't know <laughs> i was lost but by the end of the night by the end of day one I just fell in absolute love with the industry and it felt like such a family that I've really been looking for my whole life. That's awesome. That's so awesome. We've noticed that with the more that we get involved with the hunt industry as well. Um, every single place is going to have its bad apples, but for the most part, man, it is just the most welcoming type of family. And anybody that looks at it from the outside would never expect how much of a real, honestly tight knit group of people it is, but it's it's yeah. very unique yeah. in that. I, I understand that completely. That's so cool that that was kind of your original, you know, what you look at as your family. Um, that's very cool. Yeah. So you spent several years at at the old haunted uh, the old haunted state street schoolhouse, um, the one that you started <laughs> yep. at when you were eleven. Um, tell us a little more about this haunt and the impact it would have on you as you were growing up. Well, uh, so the Vermilion's Old Haunted State Street Schoolhouse. That's a cool. That's a, that's a mouthful. Little <laughs> uh, it's Bosch for oh, short. Okay. <laughs> I can handle that. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. A little more manageable. It's, uh, it, like I said, it was the original K through 12 building in Vermilion. And for years, it sat untouched until uh an old spice mill bought it and it they turned it into a factory for the town and when that finally closed down um it sat again unused uh so a, a community um organization in vermilion called the friends of harbor town okay. purchased the building and decided to well they wanted to run a museum out of it but they, they couldn't afford to make it a museum. So out of the basement and the first floor levels, they actually created a haunted house inside of it so that they could raise funds to make this museum. Okay. Well, it was a, a massive success. And um, they had uh, thousands of people come and in droves and buses. And um, we ended up becoming the number one fundraiser for the Friends of Harbor Town for over 30 years Very that cool. we were in business. That is awesome. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really amazing because everyone that works there is volunteers. No one has ever gotten paid. The directors never got paid. The owners never get paid. Even uh, the owners don't even get like a slice of what we made every year everything 100% goes to nonprofit organizations, um, which I absolutely loved. Yeah. I loved it. And I think that was actually one of the things that got me really involved with the haunt industry the way that I am, is I didn't start doing this for the money. And I've noticed that a lot of really big haunts uh, take Cedar Point or the Haunted Hoochie or some of the really big names that are in Ohio, and you'll find that they're the best scenery in, in the land, and they've got money out the wazoo for scene design, and then it comes down to their acting, and the heart just isn't in it, the way that volunteers have their heart in it. Hmm. And it's the biggest thing that I've always noticed. That's very I love the haunt industry. 
Yeah, I would never do it for money. I, I would never imagine being able to do this for money because it's just such a passion of mine. Hmm. It's very interesting. I, I like that. That's a, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit obviously before, before this. And, and I love every time that we have an interaction, you, you, the way that you speak and the way that you bring things, it's very intelligent and it's, you're very easy to talk to. I like your explanations and stuff. It's simplistic. And Thank you. I, it's interesting what you say there because it can kind of work both ways as well, I think, because we, we went to one, um, our, our actual first ever review of any haunted attraction we went to was also was volunteer based. And we actually got a bad taste in our mouth for that type of haunt because oh, it was, it was terrible. Um, and we had been there once yeah. before and it was good. And no, 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 I'm going to bring it all around for you in just a second, but <laughs> it was, it was a really, really bad experience. And it almost had me to a point oh, where it was no. like, man, I, you know, maybe the professional is the way to go because they have the money and the backing to maybe train people better and stuff like that. And then we're going to be releasing our Wells Township review here in just a few days. And they're the same way. They're 100% nonprofit organization. Every penny goes to a charity organization. And they are absolutely, to date, probably one of the best walkthrough haunted houses that we've ever experienced and completely changed our viewpoint on that. Yeah, excuse me. <laughs> Give me a second here. Um, completely changed our viewpoint on that, and it's 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 very cool to hear you talk. Because if you would have told me that before I went to Wells Township, I'd have probably been like, uh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> but now after that, I can see that it it absolutely can be done. It's all about the passion, and we've actually talked to people. We don't want to throw their name out because we've honestly ran them into the ground hard enough as is. I don't want to put them put them down anymore. <laughs> um, I kind of had a vendetta with them there for a minute. Um, but we've talked to some of the people that worked there before and it's under new management now and you can just tell that it's not there anymore. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. These things, when, when it has the right people doing it for the right reasons, they're the best experiences you're ever going to have. Because we've been to some high quality professional haunts and I'm telling you that for, for my, for my taste, Wells Township kicked all of their asses. It was phenomenal. <laughs> Nobody brings home a single penny. Um, so that's very cool to hear you talk about it like that. Um, so we'll move on to, to the next haunt that you were involved with. Um, Terror in the Field, right? And um, yep. this one yep. didn't, we don't have quite as fond memories as Terror in the Field as we do, as we do the schoolhouse? Uh, no. Um, I think even if, Terror in the Field was successful, I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much because it wasn't my home haunt I that I, I'm always going to have a bias for. Uh, so Terror in the Field ended up being the Vermilion's Haunted Schoolhouse group. We got shut down in 2007 because Ohio updated their haunted house rules and regulations for fire safety. And our building was over a certain square footage and we didn't have a sprinkler system. Mm. I shut you down we right. couldn't continue up the building, so we had to shut down. Um, the day we got shut down was opening night, 2007, is the day that the city shut us down. That's terrible. Huh. It was bad. Yeah. All of us actors, we were all in our scenes, we were all in makeup, ready to go, we're waiting for the first group to come in, and we're like, why aren't there groups coming in? What's happening? Awesome. And we got shut down, and we didn't know, the actors didn't know. So, um, in one week, we tore everything out of the schoolhouse and built it in the backyard, behind the schoolhouse, and we ran the season in the backyard, and probably the sketchiest backyard haunt that <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, that was that was passion at its finest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so um the very next year, uh, a very, very dear friend of mine named Brian Novotny owns Novotny's farm market just up the road. Uh, from where the schoolhouse is located and he has just acres of cornfield behind his his lot so he was willing to let us put a corn maze 
in his fields and run a haunted house off of his property. Very cool. It was just the most generous thing that could have happened. We, yeah. I, I still love him to death to this day. So if he's watching Brian, I can't see any of your guys' comments. So I'm really sorry, but Brian, if you're watching, Hmm. Me. <laughs> so Tara in the field didn't get the same promotional as the schoolhouse did. The schoolhouse had over 30 years runtime. Yep. People knew where it was. They knew who we were. Tara in the field was like starting a brand new home haunt. It was outdoors. There was no indoor waiting anymore. It was cold. It's rainy. It's Ohio. Yeah. It's Ohio. <laughs> yeah. No one wants to be outside if they don't have to be. That was one of our best features at the schoolhouse was that we had all indoor waiting. It was a whole indoor haunt. And now here we are outdoors in the cold, raining in a cornfield. And we're like, mm, so you're going to get muddy. It's going to be a long walk. I hope we have the volunteer actors to fill this quarter of a mile long walk. Mm. Eh, it might be a lot of corn. I don't know going to have to just be. You might see the same actor seven different times going through the corn trying to scare you multiple times. The passion. <laughs> the passion. That's, yeah. And that's, that's what kept us going. That's it. That's all that kept us going. We had one year, we had a couple hundred people, I think at most. We barely even broke even with the electric bill. But year after year, the volunteers kept coming. I kept going. Our directors kept coming. And we built. If you build them, they will come. <laughs> well, all right. If you say so. Uh, but uh... We did. And they did. They absolutely did. We still had, we still had people show up every year. That's awesome. We still had guests that came year after year that loved to come and see us because today but we are having an issue with this today pretty clearly um she was in the middle of an amazing answer about tear in the fields and then lilith just comes in there and just just swipes it away from us again and you know we're gonna keep fighting her we're gonna keep fighting her never ever had I, I I think you did something to Lilith. Cause I'm not, I, I, I haven't done anything. So don't do lie to me. I have no other explanation. I have no problem with her. You've 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 done something <laughs> to anger her. Um I, I don't I, I don't know what it is. I tried to fix it and usually I can calm her down. But she is she is a rally bitch this evening. So <laughs> I'm gonna, and, you know, Maybe it's me. Maybe she just doesn't like me. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, so Terror in the Field, you know, like like you said, if you build it, they will come, and the, and they did come yeah. out, and and that's that's it so did. awesome that people still kept trying, even in what was yeah. a, a shitty situation for you all. You know, you, yeah. you lose the schoolhouse the, the night of an event, and then you try to scramble. You get the field, which is awesome, but just it's like you said. You're, you're not only starting a brand new haunt, you're starting a brand new haunt in Ohio, which is kind of the Mac Daddy of these things at times. There are some yeah. big punches being thrown up in the Ohio area with some of these haunts. Yeah. It's not easy, I would imagine, just to start up one night and compete with these people. Um, no. You know, very well known <laughs> haunts in Ohio. Several of them. We've been to several of them. You know, it, it's, I, I get it. And to still keep pushing forward, that's such a testament. Again, like we said, the passion. The people have for this industry and and even then you know coming out for the hundred people that's going to show up for that night well fuck yeah we're gonna get out there and we're gonna do our best for the hundred people that come i love that that's all awesome. right absolutely that was uh, our attitude every night awesome so um so the land gets sold around 2016 and you're forced to go back to your roots at the original schoolhouse right that's right that's right um brian had to sell his land 
Um, and so we obviously had to move. And the Friends of Harbortown were, um, they were <sighs> nice enough to allow us to return back to the property. But the problem is that we can, still can't go inside because yeah. we don't have the sprinkler system. The, you know, the building inspector would have had to come and do a whole ordeal on the building. It was a process that we were just not going to win without a lot of money, which as a volunteer haunt, we just don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> so we prevailed again and we built a brand new haunt, brand new name again, nice. outside of the original building. So we had indoor waiting again, we had concession stands again, but it was still an outdoor haunt. So we still dealt with Ohio weather, but sure. the indoor waiting actually helped bring more people. I know in 2018, so it was last year, no, 2017, we hit a thousand customers, which was nice. the best year we had since since the schoolhouse shut down. So we were we were on a roll. Darkenwood oh, yeah. was the name of the game, and we were coming back with a fervor in 2016, 2017. Um, I was actually named director of volunteers 2016 when we came back and opened up Darkenwood. Um, so that was my 15th season. So I was finally named a director and able to run run some things the way that I wanted to. <laughs> what all did you do exactly with that? Um, what would have been so, your issue responsibilities in, in lieu of the haunt? Yeah, so um, in the haunt, even throughout uh, all of the moves that we've done, we had about six or seven directors that were in charge of specific areas of the haunted house to help make it run more smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, nearly all of them being very veteran actors of 15 plus years, 20 plus years. Uh, uh, our overall director, the assistant director, um, director of uh, construction, scene design, security, sound, I mean, you name it, we had it. And then, of course, 2016, I got named Director of Volunteers. And I was put in charge of the entire volunteer base. So I had to make sure all of the volunteers had the proper paperwork filled out, that they knew what was going on, where was going on. I had to help with actor training and helping them get acclimated, train new actors, help veteran actors, assist new actors, and make them not so angry at new actors for not knowing what they're doing. <laughs> um, and that was just my basic fundamentals. That was the very base of what I had to do. Okay. As a director, we basically took on all the roles. If the director was sick or the assistant director was sick, we all stepped up and we made decisions. We all did construction. I mean, I've... <laughs> I've been standing on the most sketchy stuff trying to nail a board that's way above my head that I can't reach with someone holding my butt to make sure that I don't fall. <laughs> I, my five foot two self has been security for, for belligerent and drunk guests. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but it's, we all, we're all volunteers and if i'm not willing to do the work of the people that i'm in charge of i can't very well put myself in charge of those people absolutely absolutely so my biggest task was i think helping out new actors and when i got there 2016 my main goal was to get our 10 to 15 volunteer ratio up I wanted more volunteers. Uh, we needed more. We had so much more space. We had more scenes to fill. And I was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it happens. It, it was rough. But our first year, 2016, I nearly hit 100 volunteers. Cool. Yeah. That's impressive. 
It was hard and chaotic and amazing. I loved it. I loved watching these kids. And that's actually who we had. As volunteers, we weren't at a cutoff age of 16. I actually had children, five-year-olds, scaring <laughs> in my hunt. That's awesome. Nice. That's so cool. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll, we'll loan you our daughter one year, and you can, you can have her <laughs> yeah. right there, tear her out to people. I would love to teach her. <laughs> We'd love to have you teach her. Um, <laughs> that's very cool. We love how much that passion comes out in you, and shows how much you love what you're doing, and everything like that. And even something like that, you know, with the, the tediousness of the, of the paperwork, and making sure that the legalities are, are straight, and everything else, man, that's, that's a lot to do for something that you're not going to ever see a penny from. And um, that's, <laughs> that's very, very cool. So so you did that job for a couple of years, and then you went to school. And I want you to tell everybody what it is you have went to school for, what it is, what is your career going to be? Because it's cool as shit. <laughs> yeah, so uh, last year in August, I began my first semester at the Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science. That's right. So I, She's going to be the one to take care of your dead ass bodies. That's right there. That's your last stop. It's your last stop. Yeah, I, I am. I'm going to be a licensed funeral director in Balmer. And I, if I had a passion for the haunt industry, I didn't think that I could have a passion more until I came down to this school. Honestly. Okay. So what, uh, so what got you into this? <laughs> it was a book, actually. Okay. It was a book I read in high school. Okay. Um, it, it was a book called Doesn't She Look Natural? About a woman named Jennifer who was going through this awful time in her life, was going through a divorce, needed money, and then got an inheritance of a, a funeral home from an estranged relative that she never even heard of. And throughout the course of the book, the author takes us through what the funeral home industry really is, the funeral home profession really is, and the passion that's behind it, and the staple in a community that it really is. And it breaks all of the stereotypes that we all think about when we think of a funeral home or our profession or funeral directors. And by the end of the book, I was so taken with this story i'm i'm sitting in my house wondering what the heck i'm gonna do with the rest of my life not happy with what i'm doing or where i'm at and i turn around and i look at my bookshelf that was right behind me in my office and there's that book just staring at me hmm. and i smiled and i was like yeah i'm gonna do that I so, want to be that person. That's, and I, I myself hadn't even thought about it. I mean, all, all joking aside, I mean, I do think what you do is badass as shit. But oh. you don't think about how how important of a job that is. I mean, because you're setting up for people to be able to say their last goodbyes. That's a very serious thing. And mm -hmm. something that, you know, that that's a, number one. It's a, it's a one-time experience as far as being able to have that goodbye. And and what you do is so critical for people to be able to move on. And that's such an important job. And it's, it's one of those jobs that you don't even necessarily think about. And you don't look at it that way. And, you know, and it's got that weird stereotype of the tall guy with the tall hat driving the hearse <laughs> down the road, you know, creepily staring over his back shoulder. It, it, yeah, it has that. But, you know, it's yeah. real people trying to get people ready for that last moment with a loved one or a friend. And um, that's that's impressive that, that you're able to do that, and, and I'm sure do it well. Um, have you had any, like, creepy dead body issues, though? Like, you know, anybody kind of, like, twitch a little bit at you or anything like that yet? <laughs> I, no, thankfully not. Um, okay. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> I'm absolutely <laughs> waiting for it to happen. Uh, every time I'm caring for one of our decedents, and I have to reach across like their their chest or something to reach on their other side. I'm always waiting for them to just onto my arm and the zombie apocalypse happens and suddenly I'm patient zero. I don't 
And this is somebody with 18 years in the Han industry, mind you, everyone. 18 years in the Han industry. And she still gets still scared, too. It. I still get scared, too, every once in a while. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the uh, funeral director and funeral, you know, death care profession, I mean, all, all joking aside, uh, you know, when, when people think about it, it's, it's rough. No one wants to think about death. No one wants to think about the end of life. It's an inevitability that none of us want to face because many of us are just, we're living our lives. We want to live our lives. We don't want to think about our loved ones not being with us. And the scary thing is that a lot of times we don't, we're not ready for it. And we're not talked about it with, you know, as children, we're kind of hidden from it. And I think the biggest thing that I get asked now is how can you do something like this? Like, how can you be around dead people all the time? Or, oh, that's so creepy. And, oh, they get really grossed out. Like, oh, it's a dead body. And every, every time I get asked, I, I tell them all the exact same thing that, when I first got into the industry, I felt that way. That's exactly the stereotype that I felt like, oh gosh, dead bodies, real dead bodies. It's really <laughs> creepy. It kind of grosses me out a little bit. And then I got down to this school. And guys, this, this school, CCMS pride, CCMS family, 100% every day of the week. This school has, is the definition of passion in this, in this profession. And what it taught me in such a short amount of time was to change my way of looking at this profession. It's as a funeral director, I, I am there to take care of your loved one and to make sure that your, your loved ones are, are looking the absolute best that they can so that when, when we go say goodbye, that you can and you're not thinking, man, they don't look like themselves. This is awful. This is heartbreaking. You're thinking I can focus on saying goodbye. And that's what I get to bring to families. Awesome. You don't think about, you know, the creepy things or, or, you know, oh, I'm working with dead bodies. I'm working with a person who was a grandma or a yeah. grandfather or a mother or brother or son or daughter, niece, nephew, best friend. I'm working with someone's loved one and I'm giving a family in one of the worst times of their life the ability to work through the grieving process, to be able to say goodbye when no one else would be able to give that to them. Yep. And giving that to a family, I think is... I can't even imagine helping someone out in a better way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you give them that. You give them a moment that that you know, they need, and and no one else can do. I and mean, that's a very that's a very particular set of skills, and and, and you know, and a passion, and everything like that. And we, uh, you know, we we like like we said a little bit at the start. You know, we've had a rough week as far as uh, stuff like that goes. We haven't lost anybody, but had a pretty good scare there for a minute. And it brings oh. to life, you know, stuff like that. You know, what would what would it be like to have to have that? You know, and I can respect that as somebody that was just kind of, you know, there just a few days ago, you know, thinking about, well, if, if it comes back this way, then we got we got a legit funeral to start planning for shortly. And, you know, you don't I, I think that you probably have one of the most thankless jobs out there. And, um, you know, I, I respect you for what you do. Um, it is badass, but I also respect you for what you do very, very much. Well, so, much. We're going to jump back into the haunt, the haunt world a little bit. Get out of the, get out of the funeral world now. <laughs> um, so you worked a couple other haunts. Um, you know, you listed several of them off there. Uh, what would out of the, out of the one other than your home haunt, if you could pick one that was your favorite experience, one that you really, really enjoyed working at, which one would you pick? Oh my gosh. No, that's like that's, that's like asking me to pick my favorite song or to pick my favorite genre or oh my gosh i have family from each one of those haunts watching this right now too <laughs> and that makes it even harder 
No pressure. I, I really want the most, right? One. I. <laughs> so. So right now, out of out of the haunts that I've I've been, I've been to many. I've I've been able to volunteer at many of them. I've been able to guest act or work at and um, including like Cedar Point, Hauntville, uh, Bloodview, you know, my home haunts, all three of them. Um, but there are two that I, I'm never going to be able to choose between and okay. I will never let them know that I like one over the other or not because it's not true. You guys stop it right now. <laughs> Um, you can't see the questions. Will you uh, ask Nick for her for him? I'm not seeing it. What was the question? Um, Nick wants to know if you're currently uh, interning at a funeral home in Cincinnati. All right, her right, letter finish this one up. So go ahead and finish the one you're up. Don't don't oh, interrupt no. like that. Oh, you uh, are you interrupting Gina like that? She's in the middle of an answer. <laughs> oh, I'll take care of her later. <laughs> I, I still love you, Trish. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna make you do it. I'm not making her do it. She's trying to talk to a little bit, though. All right, anyways, <laughs> are you currently interning? What was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> interning at a funeral home in Cincinnati. Are you currently interning at a funeral home in Cincinnati? Uh, Nick, I'm not actually currently interning. I am working as a lab assistant at the college, so I do the intakes and make sure that the lab 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 runs smoothly uh, and to help out the instructors and the students while they're in lab learning as well. Um, but I do have um, I do have an interview actually this weekend for an apprenticeship. So you got to keep your fingers crossed for me because I really oh, want this job. Absolutely. I hope you get it. I hope you get it Thank for you. sure. And um, <laughs> Nick might say if I'm getting her out of that last question. That was a good job. I just feel like it was planned there a little bit because I'm just going to move on. I'm just going to let it go. I'm just going to move right on to the next one like it never happened. All right. So you've been in the haunt industry, like we said, for a long time, scaring the shit out of people for a very long time. Is there one particular moment? And, and I know this is a tough question, too, but you don't – this one you have to answer. Um, okay. One particular moment that you look back on and you're like, that was my favorite scare of all time. Is there is there just or one real distinct memory of one that was just like man that was it was just everything lined up it was perfect. There there is one that I will never be able to forget, and it was actually I think in my third year that I was haunting, uh, so it makes it even more special because it it was my third year and I I got this scare. Whew. So. We're at the haunted schoolhouse, so we're in the building, and I was working this scene for the first time. It was the very last scene. It was the dock scene, and there's we put chain link fence throughout the scene that they have to wind themselves through before they can get outside to the exit door. Well, I put myself in a wheelchair in my Bloody Mary outfit. <laughs> it's in a nightgown with just the most massive amounts of blood. I was so sticky. I thought I would stick to the wheelchair every time. <laughs> <laughs> and I put myself in the wheelchair underneath one of the only lights in the room. And you have to walk past me to get to the exit door. And so I've got all my hair draped out in front of my face and I've got all the blood just dripping everywhere and I'm in the wheelchair and I'm not really looking at anything and I'm pushing myself back and forth with one of my feet. <laughs> and this group of like 20 something, maybe late teens, early 20 something guys turn around the corner and all of them just stop. Just dead right in front of me, like probably a good seven feet away. And they all stopped, and they're like, oh, no, hell no, I'm not, mm -mm. no, you guys can go, because I'm not going down there, and they wouldn't move, so I had to do something, and I was like, crap, what the heck am I supposed, first thing that came to mind is I literally just, I threw myself onto the concrete floor in front of me, and I crawled over to them instead, and <laughs> The guy, 
the guy in front, I thought he would have was gonna jump through the sea like through the roof. He <laughs> jumped up and jumped back in front of his his friends and he latched onto the, the chain link fence and he crawled across this chain link fence <laughs> to avoid me on the ground. Damn. <laughs> So he gets off after he gets past me, and he's running out the exit. And I, <laughs> I thought to myself, no, no, no. That's not how this is ending. So oh. I chased him barefoot down the metal stairs, through the gravel parking lot, down the street, because he did not stop running. And he whipped himself around one of the woods back down the street and I'm chasing him growling all the way and he gets to his car and he, he dukes a hazard it over the top of his car and into the car he goes and I'm slamming on his window growling trying to get him and he's crying <laughs> you've traumatized me dude for the rest of your <laughs> life he has to go to therapy now I, I kept waiting for it to stop. <laughs> and she, she's like, nah, nah, I followed him home. And then when he got home, I was beating on his door and his window outside, just growling at him in his house. And then I followed him to work. And I was just chasing him to work and crawling around and following him around work. I still, I just, I just, I just fuck with this guy all the time now. Found the spare can in that and yeah. placed myself about his yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, he was scared. Chase the dude out to his goddamn car. It was it was the best. It was the absolute best. I I loved it. I, if I could have done that one over and over and over, I completely would. He was screaming like a banshee the entire time, and I just I I figured, well, you know, if he turns down this road or he'll stop, I'll stop and I'll just turn around and walk. He didn't stop. I was like. So well, he's gonna stop. <laughs> All right. Oh man, that that is that poor guy. <laughs> me. All I, right. I hope that continue to be his nightmares. I really do. That would just tickle me pink. I bet he does. I bet every once in a while he has some weird dream that doesn't make full sense to him. <laughs> and he just wakes up in like a midnight sweat, just like, man, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Well, I hope so. That would make my whole life. Let me tell you. <laughs> so anyway, tell us about the jester. <clears throat> the jester. Uh, so the jester is my baby. Okay. Uh, I actually I actually created the jester. It was it was never supposed to happen. The jester was never supposed to be my character. Um, I never had a real character i was i was a werewolf i was bloody mary i was the goth kid that was in weird makeup mm -hmm. so i never really had a real character i growled and none of my characters were audible um so i never really could find my niche i guess mm -hmm. and our director jonathan at the time had this <laughs> black and red super simple jester costume that was like three sizes too big for me and and i i didn't have anything to change into and he was like well you got the jester costume and i was like well here we go i'm just gonna tape this to myself because it's massive on me i guess and i'm just gonna wear this shirt as a dress and be the jester I don't know. It was weird. It was it was odd. And what was so funny was that throughout the course of the first night that I was a jester, all I did was paint my face like red and black, and that was it. And it just it scared the crap out of people. And I'm like, what? No. Are you serious? This is a thing. This is okay. This is a thing. That's just all right. So now I found out what people are scared of, and I'm just gonna hone it. And I did. I I stuck with the jester for the next three, four years. And I just, yes. every year I was like, okay, so I hate this costume more than life itself. So I'm going to change the whole thing, but I'm going to keep it the jester. And I'm going to get uh, my cyber locks because those are really odd. And 
I'm gonna get teeth. I really want those uh, those dental distortions. And and I finally got the the white out zombie eyes. And nice. I got I got the jester pants and a corset and my trench coat. And I just made it my own. And oh, I was at home. The jester was my absolute alter ego and my perfect character. Very cool. The director of all of my home haunts, his name was Jonathan. And he, his character was Dios Morte. And the theme, the running theme that we kept through all of the haunts was Dios Morte's castle or Dios Morte's uh, land. Uh, so every year we had his throne room. And as the jester grew, I grew as his right hand person. And I became, I became his go to. And then when I became the director of volunteers, it was really easy for me to be that right hand man for Dios Morte and who watched out over all of his minions at the haunt and was willing to do his bidding of any evil that he wanted. Nice. And I looked the part and it just fit. It absolutely fit. And I love everything about it. <laughs> awesome. So that was, cool. that's my gesture. So you, you said that you are, you're now adapting into a dead neck. Yes. Yeah. I, I tried to research this myself because I that was there's got to be something out there on this, and I couldn't find what the hell is a dead neck. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm not going to take responsibility for the title. I'm stealing it. I actually stole it from one of my friends from the haunted hydro named Jeff Jocelyn. He right. created the dead neck. And it was like a, a dead zombie redneck. I got it right. Yeah. That was Trish's guess. <laughs> Trish, you were right. No, uh, and that's right. what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I um, when I came down to Cincinnati, I obviously was not about to stop haunting. <laughs> but the problem was, is that. The, the haunt that took me in was the Wilmington Haunted Hollow Ride. And they are outdoors, and they're, they, a lot of their scenes are hillbillies and rednecks and Camp Crystal Lake and a lot of these, like, scenes that jesters just don't fit into. <laughs> they had a, a clown town, but I wasn't a clown. And they had an overabundance of clowns most of the time. And I, I, I didn't want to do that. I knew that. I knew that my skills were enough where I could create another character and work wherever they had needed me, um, nice. which was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be their filler character for scenes that people didn't want to work. So I needed a character that fit. And I... I went up to the Haunted Hydro to one of their group photo shoots and I ran into Jeff and I saw his dead neck character and I just, I fell in love with it. I absolutely fell in love with his character and I was like, I can replicate that in a girl form. Nice. <laughs> and, and I did it and I, I, I was able to adapt it properly and I was able to actually implement it at the haunt and it was a total 360 character and it just, it, fit it it fits so much more nicely into their haunt than the jester ever would have so cool. adaption again <laughs> absolutely. absolutely and being able to be be ranged and not just be one particular thing that's awesome that's very cool it shows your skill um and uh, talking about your skill so you're completely self-taught in this industry you didn't really have anybody that showed you the ropes or anything like that um, so not only did you get into the hunt industry at the age of 11, but you do it with very little instruction. How, I mean, if, if any instruction really, how difficult was that initially starting out? I mean, was there a point where you, you, you kind of wanted to maybe throw in the towel just because, you know, you're young and there's no help and, and you're teaching yourself this, or was it just, you didn't give a shit. I was going to go get this no matter what. 
So um, it was uh, dumb hard. <laughs> As an 11 year old, I they really kind of just threw me into a scene and they were like, okay, have fun, go scare people. I'm like, ah. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll do it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm 11 and I'm like under four feet. I'm like super tiny. I'm not going to scare anyone. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. What to do. It was impossible. The first like <laughs> month that I was scaring, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't. <laughs> I'm just going to hit stuff. I don't know what loud noises. <laughs> it was. It was awful. It was awful. I kept trying to ask people, but what they were doing never worked for me because I'm tiny. And they're like, oh no, you've just got to, you know, you really got to let out your, your monster. And I'm like, Arr. <sighs> boo. Grr. I mean, it just, none of it worked. It was awful. I'm this, this is not intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen you, I've seen you get up. It's a, it's a much different person behind the mask. Uh, yes, much. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was just, it was impossible. It was absolutely impossible. And then there was one day, um, one of my friends was trying to help me out. And he, he gave me some props and stuff. And one of the props that he gave me was this, this dog collar. I still have it. And I was like, well, I'm in a scene with someone and this other person doesn't really know what to do. And so I was like, well, I've never really tried growling. I've heard a couple of my friends try growling. So, well, I guess I could try that. And so between my friend and I, I was, I was the dog and he was the handler. And for some God awful reason, it worked. I, I scared the crap out of one of our staff members. He was like, I thought there was a pit bull down there. I don't know what was going on. Suddenly there's this little itty bitty girl walking out from around the corner making this awful noise. He was like, I never would have expected to creep me the hell out. I was like, what is this? She possessed? And I was like, oh, yeah. All right. Score one for the 11 year old. Nice. Yeah. Um. And it just stuck. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you have a growl in you right now? You want a growl? Oh, I, I could try. I could try and get it out there. I'm. I'm. I really hope I don't scare my roommate, Jennifer. If you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> so okay, here we go. <laughs> How damn on earth you resist even <laughs> to not hide under one of the dead bodies one day and just wait for somebody to just come up there and just start real light with it. I I don't have the maturity to handle that. If I could physically do that and had your job or was it was working towards your job, I would be fired from every single funeral home in America because I would just go to the next one and do it and go to the next one and do it. <laughs> you are a better person than I because I couldn't control myself. I'd be underneath the table just waiting. It gets hard every once in a while. Believe me. There are some times that I know some of my friends have self-admitted that they are scaredy cats. And it takes... Every ounce of restraint that I have not to just go up behind them while they're sitting in lab or while they're sitting at school and just right <laughs> 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 here. just run around videotaping you scaring the shit out of people. <laughs> just run up behind somebody in the busy street and do that and watch them throw shit everywhere. Hell, just oh, Brian, it's next YouTube sensation. <laughs> 
wait till it's going up a bunch of flights of stairs and your flights of floors and just start mm -hmm. just locked in an elevator with that growl going on behind you. That'd be mm -mm. Mm -mm. So thank you. For that. that was that was yeah. beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move forward a little bit. We're going to get into a topic here in a second. I'm going to throw a little disclaimer on before we get into it. We're not quite there yet, um, but we're kind of leading into that, and she already knows what I'm talking about, and it's going to be fun. I can't wait to do it. It's, it's going to be our little moment to, uh, yeah. Anyways, walk-through haunts will always, always be the central theme of the haunt industry, in my humble opinion. Um, I think they are the dominant brand and always will be the dominant brand. But that does not take away from what the immersive haunt industry is growing into <laughs> and what it is becoming. And there is absolutely no doubt that the immersive haunt is growing and getting bigger and bigger each and every single year. Um, do you think there is a reason that we're seeing this trend and that people are wanting to no longer just walk through and watch, they now want to be a part of the experience. Is there something you think is maybe contributing towards that? And I mean, do you even agree with that statement? Is that something you yourself have seen? Oh yeah, absolutely. hundred percent agree with it. That's, that's a hundred percent right. Um, I think it has to do with the desensitization of our society today. Uh, every day on the news, in movies, in TV shows, we're, we're watching violence and gore and some of the worst of the worst of society. And we watch it and we're just like, oh man, glad I'm not there. Yeah. And you just go about your day. Yeah. Before, when Haunted Houses originally had come out, they were, they were sensational. Just yeah. dressing up with a, a skull on your face and walking through someplace creepy was enough to give anyone the willies. Yeah. But nowadays, with so much desensitization and, and people being so used to being scared and having their guard up so often, that immersive haunts have had to happen. I, I believe that these were an inevitability. Because even people like myself, I'm guilty of it myself. After 18 years in the industry... I don't go to a haunted house anymore to get scared. I, if I go to a haunt, I know that I have to be the disclaimer in the group and say, guys, look, I'm, if I accidentally ruin someone's scare by pointing them out before it happens, then I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm going to be the one while someone's trying to scare me looking at the scenery and wondering how the heck I can duplicate it. Yeah. Or when someone's trying to scare me, not being scared and actually just commenting on their makeup, wondering, huh, yeah. Did they use latex for that? What, I wonder if that's oil-based or water-based. How'd they do that? Mm. And they're just right there in my face. I don't, it's Immersive haunts are for people like me that yeah. are desensitized to the industry now, are desensitized to horror and scary and violence and gore. And immersive haunts forces the body into situations where you're actually on a fight or flight instinct 24 mm -hmm. seven while you're there. Because while you do understand psychologically that you can go into an immersive haunt and you're not <laughs> supposed to be touched or injured, the reality is these are real people doing real things that yes. could really hurt you. Yes. And that scare psychologically is enough to make our bodies go, Ooh. okay, that creeped me out. And it's that kind of scary that a lot of people are only able to get scared of anymore. Haunted houses just aren't enough. You know, it's since we started to do this, it, it's changed our experience a lot with the walkthrough haunt because the second we're there, we're, we're all right, let's look at the line interaction. You know, how many actors do they have out here? What do they got going on over here? How, you know, what are the prices? Do they have for fast pass? Photographing the scenery. And everything else like that, the walkthrough haunts have kind of became like that. It's 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 more of a. I mean, we still love going. I, I still have a blast going through them, but it's still scary. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a lot. I mean, yeah, you might get me with a pop scare or a drop wall I didn't see coming every once in a while, but as far as like <laughs> actual fear and terror, no, it's not going to happen. But the first time that I've been in a basement with a complete stranger and they threw a hood over my head. 
and put a rope in my hand and just said, start marching forward. That's a whole different experience. You're no longer reviewing <laughs> at that point. You're trying to, okay, I need to really focus on this rope <laughs> and everything else. And then people are touching you from the sides and you can't see what's, that's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different platform. And it's not for a novice, a novice haunted, a haunted attraction person either. It's not something that just, I don't recommend doing shock theater as your first experience in the haunted attraction world. But no. <laughs> for, for people like us, you know, it's it's almost necessary. You know, it still yeah. gives us something that, that we can do and that we can experience and that we can still get that scare factor from. Um, yeah. Now, all of that being said, um, I only want to talk about this particular thing this one particular time. And I, I want you to be the one to do it because the way that you have talked about it is better than I myself believe I could do. Um, we talk about immersive haunts a lot with our Facebook page. We're a big fan of them. We're a big supporter of them. There is one in particular that we have seen people kind of comment about and kind of talk about on our Facebook page as well. And we've always kind of ignored it and not really put a big push towards it, but we wanted to make our stance pretty clear on it. Um, everybody's heard of it. Everybody knows of it. For the most part, if you're involved with it, it's McCamey Manor. Okay. It's got the reputation for the most brutal of the brutal and that it is. I will give the devil his due. I guess he's got at least that working for his asshole self. Um, but it's not something we would ever recommend anybody go to. It's not something that we ourselves support. It's not something that we ourselves like. I absolutely hate everything that Russ McCamey represents. I hate everything that he has done. I think that he is absolutely one of the most vulgar people on the planet. And he has some sick pleasures, I believe, um, that he gets out of this. This isn't about, um, this isn't about the haunt. This isn't about people enjoying this experience. This is about him getting some sick fetish kick off of this, in my personal opinion. Um, and we don't support it. We don't like it or anything like that. But I wanted you to be able to tell them <clears throat> a little bit about what you were talking to me about as to what really it is about this place that, that doesn't make it a haunt. It doesn't make it anything to do with the haunt community in any way, shape or form and why Russ McKimmy is the piece of shit that I say he is. So I actually have quite an in-depth knowledge of McKamey Manor. Uh, Russ and I used to be friends and I was actually trying to help him relocate McCamey Manor um, back in about 2015. I was trying to help him relocate it to Ohio. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> um, I, yeah, <laughs> looking back, oh, thank God that didn't happen. I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'd, I'd probably be in jail. So, <laughs> so let me start mm, okay so let me start by saying mckamey manor comfortable about talking about don't don't feel like you have to go into no, i never never I, i'll be fine <laughs> i'll be i've been fine <laughs> through all of the hate mail that i've received because of my feelings towards mckamey manor and how vocal i've been about it in the past um i'm gonna start all of it by saying I was one of the most biggest advocates for McKamey Manor at one point in time. And my friend Paul and I were actually supposed to take a road trip out to San Diego just to go through. And Russ was actually going to pay my way in. He was going to, he wanted me to come out because I told him that he's not going to get me. He's just, he's just not, I'm going to be the person that breaks that new, if you last eight hours, you're going to get your refund. You're going to get be the first person that's ever lasted all the way through McKamey Manor. And I wanted to be that person because, you know, I've been in the industry for so long and I, you know, walk through haunts are a lot the same anymore. And I wanted something new. I wanted something scary. I wanted something real. And McKamey Manor was the epitome at one point of immersive haunts. <laughs> now with that being said <laughs> the reality behind McKinney Manor I found when Russ asked me to help him out 
and to bounce ideas off of new scenes, off of actors, off of everything. Um, when it came to behind the scenes, when it came to moving his haunt, uh, construction, what to do, how to build, where to build, uh, and legalities behind things. Um, the reason Russ wanted to move was because he couldn't charge admission. He wasn't supposed to charge admission to his haunt because he's in a residential area. That's one of the biggest reasons he wanted to move. So I was trying to help him out with that. Well, in the process, I learned who Russ really was. And I learned what the haunt really was. And his new eight hour immersion haunt was nothing more than his cronies beating people and abusing people physically for hours putting the body through the worst that a body should have to go through physically until you literally couldn't make it eight hours. Now, I wouldn't have had as much of an issue with it if he would have had some type of medical staff at every immersion, but he didn't. He had, his actors weren't properly trained. They didn't have that line that they stopped at where immersion haunts do. There is always a line that you don't cross in immersion haunts and McKamey Manor didn't have that line. And their actors were dangerous and they didn't know when to stop. They didn't know how to stop. They didn't want to stop for many of them. And I came to find out that there was actually one guy who was a sex offender and a felon on his staff that they were allowing to do these emergent haunts with women. And, and they allowed this violent offender to work in an emergent haunt and basically beat people without getting arrested again. You get picked up in his red van with a bag thrown over your head, thrown into the van, and for a good couple miles, all that's happening is you're getting the shit beat out of you. That's <laughs> what happened. That's not an immersion haunt. No. That's the, and he has you sign this, this contract that he thinks is airtight because no one's ever won a lawsuit against him. <sighs> He's preying on women that are barely 18, early 20s, that, that don't know the legal system, that don't know their rights, that don't realize that there is no contract out there that would hold up if you physically know that you're purposefully inflicting abuse upon somebody. Yeah. The minute you know you're purposefully going to injure someone in a haunt, that contract is immediately null and void. His contract is fake. It's a fake contract. And he thinks that he's just hiding behind it because no one has any proof of anything. Because all of the videotaping that he does to make sure that he covers his own butt suddenly becomes erased in situations where it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Or there is no videotape of certain situations where women are screaming to get out, that people were begging for them to stop. And he said, no, there is no stop here. And he forced them to keep going. It's called kidnapping. It's, it's. Yeah. yeah being forced and held against your will and he did it and he thinks his contract saves him from that and i got to learn all about these legalities and i tried to explain to russ russ you can't do this that's that's not that's not okay like and he was trying to figure out how he can have a haunt without a safe word or how he can skirt around laws in his city so that he can charge <laughs> or that go fund me that he started towards the end of his, his time at McKinney Manor in California. 
actually anyone that donated was supposed to get preferential treatment, meaning they'd get chosen first to go through McKinney Manor if they donated $250 or more to the GoFundMe, which is considered an admission fee in California. I don't know. So I got into it with Russ and he ended up turning against me and quite a few people that had walked through his haunt and they all wanted justice for themselves for the abuse that they'd suffered. People came out with going to the hospital and immense bruising all over their body. They had documentation of it. And Russ thought that his contract was going to protect him. And so myself feeling like this was just the most immoral thing. I couldn't stand by him. And I started speaking out against him. And then he labeled me a hater. And <laughs> along with all of the other people, oh yeah, I was one of his haters. I was one of those original haters that came up the low information crowd, like he likes to put it. But the thing is, is that he was so easy to read. He's a narcissist. Oh, he absolutely. A <laughs> absolutely. How much more easy can you get? You yeah. like the power. He liked being able to have power over defenseless women. He videotaped everything. And mm -hmm. if you'll notice, the vast majority of people that went through were women. Yeah. They were all younger women. They weren't mm -hmm. men. It's very rare. It, very rare. And I... So, I just... McCamey Manor, he moved. He... The biggest reason we ended up losing each other was because while I was trying to get him a building here in Ohio... I was talking to real estate agents. I was talking to the fire department. I was going around the community doing surveys for him. I was paying for stuff out of my own pocket to be able to help him out thinking I was going to be reimbursed. And then one day I get on Facebook and I see that he's moving and he already has moved to a donated building in Indiana that has no proper fire code that isn't up to standards rules or regulations that he didn't ask the city if it was even okay if he was there the city had no idea this man was trying to crouch in underneath the radar and so myself and a couple more of the low information crowd when we learned about it contacted the city and said you need to stop this <laughs> yeah and we did they yeah. they stopped mckinney manor from going in in indiana while Russ went very deep underground, basically, and kept to himself and a few of his followers and moved to Tennessee, where he hooked up with another haunt. I don't remember the name of it right now. And they're running jointly right now. So I don't even know if you can call him McCamey Manor anymore, but he's, it's gone. McCamey Manor is dead, and it needs to stay that way. Because yeah. Russ is the worst of the worst, and to call his haunt a haunt is an absolute slap to this profession. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one of the key things, I mean, even if you take, a, take away who Russ is himself and kind of even take him out of the picture and just look at the attraction, I guess, if you want to use a term for it or whatever the fuck you want to call it, um, you look at it just in and of itself, when the goal is no longer to entertain the person that has came there, you're no longer, you're there for yourself. And when the, the safe word, that is a trust between, between the person that is conducting the haunt and the person going through it. And if I don't have the ultimate control to at any point be able to say, okay, now I've, I've, I've never said one and I have no intentions of ever calling one. But I still need to be the one that's in control that can say, okay, this is my line. I didn't realize until I got here, but this is mine and I'm out. And that needs to be the end of it. The show's over, the lights come back on, and you're taken out. That's it. Game over. To tell somebody yeah. no, it's just like you said, this is, this is now torture. This has gone on to something else. 
And again, even if that's the experience you want to go with, if you, I don't want to get beat up physically. That's not for me. But I, I get there's probably some people out there that got to push their limits all the way as far as they can. And if, if that is truly going to be your thing and somebody truly did it right, like there's a medical professional here, 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 and it's still all cared and the person can still stop it, that's a whole different ballgame. Okay, yes. not for me, not my cup of tea. That's a little too much, but that's a whole different yeah. ballgame. The reason that I wanted to talk about him, and I'm glad to hear that the whole operation is at this moment dead, is number one, while McKinney Manor may be dead, it doesn't mean that some asshole's not going to start another one up right down the block under a new name or under something else. So I wanted to be able to talk about it for a minute and make sure that as much love as we give the immersive haunt community, the people realize there is a difference in some stuff out there and to be aware of what you're signing up for. We do our research into each and every single one of these before we go out to any of these immersive funds. Um, we usually end up talking to the owners and stuff like that beforehand. And I realize that not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the time to do that and stuff like that, but do your homework, understand what it is you're signing up for, pay attention to what it is you're signing. Because while his contract does not protect him, there is a reason he has such a lengthy one. There is a reason that it was done the way that it was done. While he is an asshole, he's not completely retarded, okay? He knew how to play people, and there are other people out there that will know how to play you as well. So please, just be aware of what you're getting into. That's the only reason we even wanted to talk about it. That's the only reason we even brought it up, is just to be able to say, be fucking aware of what you're doing out there. The haunt industry is a wonderful industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I haven't met a person in it yet that I haven't really liked. Um, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I haven't really found anybody. Um, you know, we had a no-show on Talking Scared. So other than him, um, I haven't found <laughs> anybody in the haunt industry that, I, that, that, you know, I've had an issue with. Um, but there's still assholes out there. It's, it's in every single group. And just always be aware of what you're getting into. <clears throat> Don't be the dummy that walks into a McCamey Manor and then goes, oh, my God, I didn't know it was this. You should have. <laughs> you should have well before you ever got there. Um, you know, yeah. even when we do these shock theaters and, and scare house, we have a, an idea of what we're getting into. Um, you know, we don't know everything that's going to happen, but we have an idea. And again, the key is if they tell you there's no safe word, just go home, get back in your car and leave. Just go. That's not for you. That's not what you want to do. So thank you for being willing to talk about that. I know it's not a subject you like to really approach <laughs> and I do appreciate you taking the time to explain that because you're able to explain yeah, it better yeah. than what I ever could and and why <laughs> we four places like that um so again thank you um uh, yeah so to throw out there you know we don't want to promote any actors that are involved in the mishandling of people we've oh, had well yeah I think issues, that kind of you know? that probably goes without saying but yeah you know if there's actors and actresses that that's your thing um, you're probably not going to be making it on to Talking no. Scared uh, uh, ever, 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 ever. So Trish wanted me to throw that out there. Um, all right, so we're going to we're going to go ahead and kind of wrap it up here. Um, but it's always our tradition at the end of these to allow allow the guest to have a moment to promote whatever current organization they may or may not be working for, or just an organization that they love and they want to throw out there for them, as well as just any thoughts they have on the haunt industry in general. Or just any last parting thoughts, even if the last parting thought is nothing more than see you later. We always open up the floor for it. So it's all yours. Close it out however you want. So I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't give the most heartfelt, love-filled shout out to my haunts. Because I have two now. I have two haunts now. Since I moved to Cincinnati, I have two. I have the haunt that took me in when I was in desperate need of someone down here. Someone that understood me that I could go to and feel at home at the Wilmington Haunted Hollow Ride here in Wilmington, Ohio. So Sandy and her husband, everyone at the haunt, Brian, Lan, I mean, Lisa, I can't even begin to explain how in one short season, these amazing people took me in a complete stranger. And you know how haunt actors can be. Oh, God, she's an outside haunt actor. 
I, mm -mm, no, no, we don't like her. No, no, that's not a thing. We can get, she can go over there. All the, all the way over there. Yeah, put her in the back. Yeah, that's, that's, you want to work, that's fine. She's not really one of us. It's, no. They took me in like I was one of their own and made me feel so loved and so cared about. And I, I honestly don't think I could say thank you to them enough for that because I'm in a new place, a new city. I have no friends down here, no haunt, no family. <laughs> and they, they did, they took me in and I, I really did feel right at home at the Haunted Hollow Ride. Uh, and I am hopefully keeping my fingers crossed, not going to be as busy as I was last year, where I'll actually be able to work with them more this awesome. year. Awesome. <laughs> but again, I, I, can't, I can't leave out my family up at the Haunted Hydro in Fremont. Fremont, Ohio, Haunted Hydro, all the way, Haunted Hydro family with Crazy Bob. I love my Hydro family. And they have so many events that go on year round that make them involved in the community that bring haunt actors and, and the industry and models and photographers and, and every walks of life together all throughout the year. So it's not just during the haunt industry that I get family to surround myself with. And it isn't just haunt actors, it's, it's with my modeling, it's, it's getting to see the other side of, of the monster, and it's amazing. They have, um, I helped them with one of their MHC convention tours, they were one of the stops. I think they were the last stop last year on the MHC, uh, the Midwest Haunters convention tour. Cool. And so I was able to go out there and they allowed me to guest act with them, which just absolutely warmed my heart to be able to scare with these people they're the most wonderful people and um crazy bob has just god i love you bob <laughs> i don't think i can put it any other way you mean so much to me nice. but they they do haunt stuff year round and they they keep the haunt profession alive outside of October, which I think is immensely important because yeah. kind of like the theme profession, people don't think about it until it's time to have it. So until October comes, people are like, nah, you've haunted houses, what? No, why would you want, not at the Hydro, absolutely not. No, it is February, we're gonna do a Cupid scare event in February. It's Krampus, cause it's Christmas and you know, we're going to have a Friday the 13th event and a Lights Out event. And they, right. they just give you all of these chances to get in the industry and to say, hey, we're, you, you know, we're a, we're a haunt industry and we're a haunted house and we're here year round and you're going to remember us every step of the way. And, and that kind of voice in the community, I think, is so important, Absolutely. especially for... Ohio haunts. We have so many others to compete against. Yes. So something like that to stand out is amazing. So I highly suggest people get into that to go to the Haunted Hydro, do all of their events, go to the Wilmington Haunted Hollow Ride this October and see their uh, fire breathing semi trucks. Major event. You won't be sorry. It's uh, the Wilmington Haunted Hollow Ride is like any, unlike any other haunt that I've ever been to anywhere. And you absolutely will not be disappointed. I 100% guarantee you will love every last bit of it. Very cool. But those are my promotions. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm so thankful for, for both you and Trish for letting me come and talk with you guys and that you're interested you. in my story. It meant the you. absolute world to me that you reached out. Um, <clears throat> we love doing this. We love, love providing this opportunity. We love you to death. Um, we've got some other things that, that we've obviously, we, we, we've talked with her a good bit. Uh, we're going to continue to talk with her a good bit. We have some other stuff in the works, um, that we're hoping to have coming down the pipeline here, uh, Next shortly, year. shortly, probably, probably looking towards the end of this year, early, early next year. Uh, we're going to have something super special for you all. 
Um, we're really working hard on this. She's right alongside with us on helping us with this. And that's really all we're going to talk about for it right now. Um, but there is some really cool shit that I hope we're going to be able to talk to you about a lot more here in a few months. But um, as of right now, that's it's regretfully it's going to do it. I'm out of questions. I've Hold got on. A, I got a statement for her. Okay. Uh, Andrew says that Shackles, Mayhem, and Hollow Crew love you and are grateful for all, all of your awesomeness. I love you guys so much. Oh my God. My Hollows crew, I I can't thank you guys enough for tuning in and watching. I love you guys. I told you they're amazing. I just, I can't look at that. Oh. And, uh, God. We, we thank you as well. And, and, and we thank you more importantly. Uh, we always we thank you every single person that turned in and, and the viewers and the, and the interaction. And we always bow down to you all. Um, and we thank you so much. Even though you pissed off Lilith, we don't know what you did yet. We're going to have to figure it out. Um, because I, I get up there somehow. <laughs> we're going to have to do this relationship. Um, she seemed to chill out there at the end. So maybe, maybe yeah. we fixed it. We'll see. Um, Jackie says we love you, Gina. Jackie says we love you. Oh, oh my God. Guys, I can't. Don't do this to me on, on live Facebook feeds here. God. <laughs> don't make me a mess now. On live Facebook or anything like that. Thank you all so much. Gina, thank you. We'll obviously always be in contact. We'll be talking to you again shortly. Thank you so much. Haunted Honeymooners, Talking Scared. We'll see you next Monday. Good night.